So hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about subarachnoid hemorrhage. So before we go into the topic, from now onwards I'll be uploading videos on every Monday and every Friday, and I've also attached the link to my Google Drive document in the description below. Uh, it has all the uh, notes which I've created for all the videos I've uploaded till date. Okay, now let's go into the topic. So coming to the important causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So usually we think that berry aneurysm is the most common cause. Actually, berry aneurysm is the most common cause of su spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. But when you take subarachnoid hemorrhage as a whole, head injury is the most common cause. Okay, so this is an important MCQ. So remember, the top cause of SCH is going to be head injury, followed by berry aneurysm. Other causes could be AV malformations. And sometimes when the intraparenchymal hemorrhage dissects into the subarachnoid plane. Okay, so an extension of an intracerebral hemorrhage can cause SAH. So coming to the epidemiology of SAH, remember that berry aneurysms are actually common. They're present in 2% of all adults. And subarachnoid hemorrhage has a high mortality rate. It has a mortality rate of 45% in one month. And usually berry aneurysms don't occur in the pediatric age group. They're commonly seen only in adults with a peak incidence at 35 to 65 years of age. Okay, so associated conditions with berry aneurysms, there are two things you should not forget. So one is going to be autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and the other is going to be coarctation of iota. So you should not forget these. These two are associated with berry aneurysms, commonly associated with berry aneurysms. Others could be fibromuscular dysplasia, moya moya disease and AV malformations of the brain. Don't forget ADPKD and coarctation of iota. Okay, now coming to berry aneurysms. So berry aneurysms most commonly are going to occur in the anterior part of the circular villus. 85% to 90% are present in the anterior part of the circular villus and 20% of them are going to be multiple. And the most common site of rupture is going to be the dome. Okay, so actually when you have an aneurysm, you have the neck of the aneurysm and then you have the dome. The most common site of rupture is going to be in the dome. This is a very important MCQ question. Okay, so what is a giant aneurysm? So a giant aneurysm is where the diameter is more than 2.5 centimeters and remember the risk of rupture in giant aneurysm is very high. The annual rupture rate is around 6 percentage. So where do you commonly see these giant aneurysms? So you, they are commonly seen in three important places. So number one is going to be the terminal internal carotid artery. Next we have the middle cerebral artery bifurcation. the MCA bifurcation and third is going to be the top of the basilar artery top of the basilar artery so these three places okay these are the three places where you commonly see giant aneurysms terminal internal carotid artery the middle cerebral artery bifurcation and the top of the basilar artery remember more than 2.5 centimeters is very important question okay so what overall what are the common sites where we see berry aneurysms okay so just remember that berry aneurysms are going to happen in places where the arteries are going to bifurcate or they're going to meet that's where you're going to commonly see them so where do we see them you see them in the proximal anterior communicating artery the origin of the posterior communicating artery from the internal carotid artery the first middle cerebral artery bifurcation and the bifurcation of the internal carotid artery to the uh, middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery so these are the four common sites of berry aneurysms okay there are three important risk factors for rupture. So these things, these three risk factors are very, very important. So one in the size is more than seven millimeters and the size, the diameter of the aneurysm is more than seven millimeters and top of basilar artery aneurysms. Also remember top of basilar artery aneurysms are common site for giant aneurysms. Okay. So remember giant aneurysm, top of basilar artery, it's very common. And then origin of the posterior communicating artery. These are the three important risk factors for a berry aneurysm to rupture. Now coming to the symptoms. So as you know, berry aneurysm is usually asymptomatic. It's only going to present when it's going to rupture and present as subarachnoid hemorrhage. But sometimes if the aneurysm is present in a certain location where it's going to cause certain compressive symptoms, that time it can cause prodromal symptoms. Okay, based on the location, you can cause prodromal symptoms. So when the aneurysm is at the posterior communicating artery and internal carotid artery junction, it can cause a third nerve palsy with pupillary involvement along with retroorbital pain. So always remember that the pupillary fibers in the third cranial nerve are actually present in the periphery. So any compressive pathology of the third cranial nerve is going to be associated with pupillary involvement. So if it's going to be present at the cavernous sinus, it's going to cause sixth nerve palsy. If it's going to be present in the supraclinoid carotid or the anterior cerebral artery, it can cause visual field effects. In the posterior inferior cerebral artery and the anterior inferior cerebral artery, it can cause occipital or posterior cervical pain. And the middle cerebral artery, if it's present, it can pr uh, present as retroorbital pain or pain in the lower temple. 
Okay. Now come to the clinical features of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the three things you should remember is when the patient is going to present with severe acute onset thunderclap headache. Next, when the patient is going to present with loss of consciousness, and when the patient is not going to have any focal neurological deficit. So when you have a constellation of these three symptoms, the first thing that should come to your mind is subarachnoid hemorrhage, a severe headache with abrupt loss of consciousness without any focal signs or without any focal neurological deficits. Okay, so you're going to have a sudden onset excruciating thunderclap headache. Okay, the patient's going to have the worst headache that he or she expected in their life. Okay, so what are the other differential diagnoses for thunderclap headache? So we have a, a, a variant of headache which is known as primary thunderclap headache. So that can cause th uh, thunderclap headache, then diffuse vasospasm that is called Fleming syndrome, pituitary apoplexy, hypertensive encephalopathy, and arterial dissection, both intra or extracranial arterial dissection. So this is the differential diagnosis for thunderclap headache. Next is going to present with sudden LOC. And the patient is going to have vomiting because of raised ICT. And neck stiffness. Okay, why the patient is going to have neck stiffness? Because the subarachnoid blood is going to go and irritate the meninges. So that time the patient will have neck stiffness. Remember, just like intraparenchymal hemorrhage, seizures are not a common or presenting feature of SCH. Only 10 to 25% are going to have it and no focal neurological deficit. Usually there are no focal neurological deficits. Sometimes the subarachnoid blood can collect and form a hematoma and compress the local uh, cerebral structures over there. But usually there is no focal neurological deficits. And sometimes the patient will have certain warning headaches. Okay, So before the aneurysm actually ruptures, there, before there is a full blown rupture, there will be small ruptures or leak into the subarachnoid space which causes headache okay so this is known as sentinel bleeds very very important mcq question sentinel bleeds okay so i want to discuss this separately okay so this is a very very important mcq question so what is tersen syndrome so basically what happens is in subarachnoid hemorrhage the blood sometimes will dissect into the preretinal or subhyoid plane okay so the uh, ocular finding or the ophthalmic finding in subarachnoid hemorrhage is going to be preretinal or subhyoid hemorrhage very very important Okay, so we have two grading scales for SCH, just for prognosticating purposes. If you remember the names, it's enough. So we have Hunt Hess scale and we have the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society scale, WFNS scale. Okay, now how are we going to investigate a case of SCH? So once you have a patient coming with severe headache, LOC and without any focal neurological deficit, the first investigation you're going to do is a non-contrast CT, just like an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So non-contrast CT is going to pick up 95% of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Sometimes the SCH is going to be very small or it's going to be missed in the CT but still your doubt, your clinical uh, uh, your clinical doubt of SCH is going to be very high. That time you can go for a lumbar puncture. So the CT is non-diagnostic. You can go for a lumbar puncture. So what you're going to look over here is the presence of subarachnoid blood and you're going to look for CSF xanthochromia. Very very important MCQ. So basically what happens is the hemoglobin in the subarachnoid uh, space is going to break down into bilirubin. So this gives a yellow yellow stain to the CSF. Okay, this is what we're going to detect as CSF xanthochromia. Uh, remember that you al always have to centrifuge the CSF sample before commenting or uh, looking for xanthochromia. You have to centrifuge the CSF sample. Okay, so CSF xanthochromia is going to appear at 6 to 12 hours. It peaks at around 2 days and it lasts for around 1 to 4 weeks. Okay. And very important, diagnosing SH is okay, but you have to uh, have to locate the aneurysms. If it's an aneurysmal bleed, you have to find out the location of the aneurysm. Because if you're not going to treat the aneurysm, the patient's going to go for re-rupture or re-bleed, which has a very, very bad prognosis. So how you're going to detect the aneurysm, you can go for a four-vessel conventional X-ray angiography, or you can go for a CT angiography. Okay, and you always have to see twice daily or daily serum electrolytes because you have to look for hyponatremia. The hyponatremia is very common in SCH and is very profound. So you have to daily monitor the electrolytes in these patients and the complete blood clot may have a non-specific leukocytosis. Right. So what are the cardiac manifestations of SCH? So what's going to happen in SCH is there's going to be a sympathetic uh, overactivity. There's going to be a lot of catecholamines in the circulation. So this causes uh, certain uh, ECG findings which we'll discuss over here. So it can cause prolonged QRS prolonged QTC and sometimes you can have peaked or deeply inverted symmetrical T waves or deeply inverted giant T waves. This is known as cerebral T waves. Very, very important question.
this is known as cerebral t waves and usually if you have an mi or some other uh, uh, coronary artery disease you are going to have regional wall motion abnormalities along the vascular territories but over here because it's because of sympathetic over activity sometimes the patient will develop a reversible cardiomyopathy so the echo over here is going to show regional wall motion abnormalities which are going to be present along the distribution of the sympathetic nerves and you also the trop levels also might be raised okay now what are the delayed neurological deficits so we have four important delayed neurological deficits which are present in subarachnoid hemorrhage okay so number one is going to be re-rupture okay and the risk of re-rupture is around 30 percent if you're not going to treat the neurism if you're not going to coil or clip the neurism the risk of re-rupture or re-bleeding is going to be 30 percentage of the first month peaking within seven days that's a very bad prognosis so that's why it's very important to identify and treat berry aneurysms in all cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage the, pro the mortality is more than 50 percentage in re-bleed Next is hydrocephalus. So you can have an acute hydrocephalus which presents as stupor or coma or in the long run you can have normal pressure hydrocephalus which is going to present with dementia, uh, gait abnormalities and urinary incontinence. Okay, now coming to the one of the most important delayed neurological deficits that is delayed cerebral ischemia which is because of vasospasm. So what happens is the subarachnoid blood irritates the vessel wall causing severe vasospasm. So the patient will develop uh, focal neurological deficit depending on which vessel is going for undergoing uh, vasospasm. So it's common, it's present in 30% of the patient, usually appears on day 4 to day 14, peaking at one week and it is a major cause of delayed morbidity and mortality in subarachnoid hemorrhage. The problem is, uh, delayed cerebral ischemia is also going to present as uh, coma or stupor and also acute hydrocephalus is also going to present with altered sensorium. So how are you going to differentiate it? You're going to differentiate with the transcranial Doppler. So the transcranial Doppler you can diagnose delayed cerebral ischemia due to vasospasm. Okay, this is an important question. Okay, hyponatremia, like we discussed earlier, the hyponatremia is very common in subarachnoid hemorrhage. It usually occurs within the first 14 days and it is very profound. Okay, it's due to both atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide. Remember, usually for hyponatremia, the first thing we're going to do is restrict free water. But remember, free water restriction is contraindicated when hyponatremia develops in the scenario of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Because already the patient is going to have vasospasm. So because of that, he is at risk of developing delayed cerebral ischemia. If you By uh, doing free water restriction, you're going to cause hypovolemia and worsen the risk of stroke going to significantly increase the risk of stroke. So never free restrict free water in hyponatremia, which occurs in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, now coming to treatment. So coming to the surgical management, we have to treat the aneurysm. So like we discussed earlier, it's very important to treat the aneurysm. So we have endovascular coiling and surgical clipping. So which is the preferred, ma preferred uh, management is going to be endovascular coiling. Okay, so this is based on the ISAT study okay so this is based on the ISAID study okay where the mortality was much less in the endovascular coiling group however in the long term the functional outcome is pretty much the same for both but remember that endovascular coiling has a very small relatively a small but higher risk of re-bleed there's a higher risk of re-bleeding or re-rupture compared to the surgical clipping group but remember overall if you take endovascular coiling is preferred compared to surgical clipping and if the patient is going to develop acute hydrocephalus you're going to have to put in a ventricular drain okay now coming to the medical management of subarachnoid hemorrhage the target cerebral, perfu uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is going to be 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury so whether we give anticonvulsants anti or not it's pretty controversial because when the patient is going to develop a seizure the risk of re-bleed is very high so if the patient is going to develop a, not due to surgery okay so actually due to seizure so the main reason most of the centers are giving anticonvulsants is to avoid seizure related re-bleeding or re-rupture. Okay, but otherwise it is not generally recommended. But maybe for this purpose, anticonvulsants can be given. Now we are going to treat delayed cerebral ischemia. Okay, so the drug of choice over here. So basically what happens in delayed cerebral ischemia, there is going to be severe vasospasm. So we want to treat this vasospasm. So you can use nimodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. 60 milligrams is given 4th hourly. Next, very, very important question, triple H therapy. So what you do is you increase the patient's BP. Okay, you're going to give a lot of IV fluids, vasopressors, and you're going to cause hypertension, hypervolemia, and hemodilution to open up that vasospasm. But remember, triple H therapy should not be attempted unless the patient's aneurysm is treated. If you're going to give triple H therapy in an untreated aneurysm, the risk of re-bleed or re-rupture is very high. So after doing endovascular coiling or surgical clipping, once you have treated the aneurysm, that time after that you can go for triple H therapy. Okay, otherwise you should not. Next is intra-arterial vasodilators and in certain very severe vasospasm, you can try percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. 
Okay, now coming to treating hyponatremia. So as we as we uh, discussed earlier, hyponatremia is very severe. It's very common in subarachnoid hemorrhage. It occurs in the first 14 days. And very very important. I'm emphasizing on this point again. Free water restriction is contraindicated because it's going to cause hypovolemia and increase the risk of stroke. Okay, most of the times you'll have to be giving intravenous hypertonic saline. Okay, so this is about subarachnoid hemorrhage. I think I've discussed most of the important points. Thank you.